I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 4 is going to be where we start tonight, our focal text tonight. If, uh, if you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 962. That's 962, and you will find the Gospel of Matthew chapter 4, our text. And as always, if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, you want to read God's Word, study God's Word, learn what we're talking about here, then please take one of those with you. It is a gift from us to you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, then God will change your life. Hey, uh, tis the season, isn't it? Tis the season for change. Uh, you, you may not be aware of that, but uh, that's kind of what the season is all about. I mean, for us as a church, it's a season to change because we're launching two new campuses on January the 6th, uh, one down in Parker. We've already mentioned they're having a Christmas Eve service as a pre-launch kind of service. Uh, the other services over at McCulloch uh, beginning of January 6th, uh, we're calling it Calvary Unplugged. Uh, Joseph Pfeiffer is going to be the primary worship leader. And, and it's just going to be uh, sometimes video, sometimes live venue. And, and, if, and we, we just need some people to go over there and, and lead their friends to a life-changing relationship with Jesus in that place uh, and free up some seats over in this place. So uh, it's a season of change. Uh, because we're adding these new campuses, we're also adding new staff. You'll keep seeing new faces and, and, uh, as they're coming. So it's a season of change, and it's a season of Christmas. But... I don't know if you realize this or not, but Christmas is kind of a season of change. Every, every year, everything changes for Christmas, right? Your schedule changes at Christmas, right? Suddenly you've got Christmas parties to go to, whether you want to or not. I don't know how that happened. It's such, Christmas parties are such a great idea, right? Until you've gone to the eighth one in a row. And you used to like white elephant gifts. Now, if somebody mentions the word white elephant, you just want to like shred that right, right there. You know, you, you used to like the, the idea of Christmas parties, and, and, but suddenly you've, your schedule changes. There's all kinds of things that are, there's time off. Your kids are out of school. You got to travel. How many of you are going to travel someplace for Christmas? Okay, a lot of hands go up. How many of you are having people travel to you for, for Christmas? A lot more hands go up. See, it's, it's changed. There's, it's a different kind of season. Your house changes. Have you noticed this? People put trees in their houses at Christmas. What kind of insanity is that? We rearrange the furniture for the tree to fit. We put lights up. I, of course, I call Christmas lights, uh, at least ones on the outside, the annual uh, marital contention in, uh, in our family. And so one of us is going to be disappointed. Uh, and uh, that's just the way that that's going to be. And, and so I don't know that, how that is in your family or not, but it's a, it's a season of change. Of course, some of you are like, yeah, I know you're sitting here smugly right now going, we didn't change anything at the house because we're going to go visit the kids at Christmas and there's no kids here and there's no tree in my house. Well, good for you, okay? <laughs> it's still a season of change because you've got to travel now. You've got to go someplace. You've got to do that and celebrate. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a change in music because suddenly every radio station is playing all the same songs, just different styles, right? That's kind of weird, but uh, it's true. It's a season of change when it comes to shopping because the other 11 months out of the year, you pretty much shop for your food and necessities and stuff like that. Now suddenly you've got a list that may be this long of things to find and, and things to buy and stuff to do. And then the church doesn't help because we give you these bags to fill up and you go shopping for that. So how many love the changes that accompany Christmas? Let's see. Oh, lots of hands go up. How many of you don't really like the changes that come with Christmas? I see those hands. We're going to pray for you, Grinches, that your hearts grow three sizes tonight. Okay? But we are discussing our final core value. We've talked about calling, that leading people to life change isn't optional. We've talked about character, that we can't represent Jesus unless we reflect his character. Last week we talked about connection, that life change happens in the context of relationships. And tonight we're talking about change change. It's impossible to follow Jesus and stay the same. It's one of our core values here at Calvary. If you didn't know that, then, and then welcome to the, the, the family. Uh, Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 18. It's a simple story, right? The beginning of Jesus' ministry. It says, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon, 
who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. For they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed Jesus. And going on from there, Jesus saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. If you flip over a, a few pages to chapter 9, verse 9, the, the narrative kind of continues in the same vein. It says, And Jesus passed by on from there, and he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And Jesus said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed Jesus. Jesus called, they followed, and their lives were never the same again. Jesus called, they followed, and their lives were never the same again. You see, God is in the business of change. God is in the business of change. You know, God created the world. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and they were perfect. They were, they, they were spotless, and, and he put people in it, and people wrecked it through sin. Romans chapter 5, verse, verse 12 says, For just as through one man sin entered the world, and through sin death, therefore all died because all sinned. We wrecked God's perfect creation. We, we ruined it, and yet God didn't stop there. He redeemed it by sending Jesus into this world to pay for our sins. That's the redemption. That's the, the change. And, and ultimately, everyone who follows Jesus will be changed. We'll get perfect bodies. 1 Corinthians 15 says they're incorruptible, they're imperishable. That we get to trade in these nasty, broken down pieces of junk that we're inhabiting, and we get brand new, imperishable bodies. And, and in Revelation chapter 2, yeah, you guys are excited. Some of us are looking forward to the trade in more than others. You live long enough, you want the trade in. That's how it works. But we're going to inhabit a perfect world with no more suffering or sorrow or death or pain or politics. You know, isn't that amazing? I just added that one in there. That was not listed in Scripture, but it occurred to me. And we get more excited about that. Pain I can live with, politics I can live I need that gone. It's, you know, it's going to be perfect. That's, that's the message of the gospel. Change. In fact, the gospel message is all about change. Uh, Jesus, in John chapter 3, says, uh, follow me, uh, you got to be born again. He gives us new birth. He says, if you want to see the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. And, and then uh, the apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians is talking about what it is to be in Christ. He says, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old things pass away. Everything becomes new. You're a new creation in Christ. In Ephesians, uh, the letter to the church at Ephesus, the Apostle Paul says, hey, you were dead in your trespasses and sins, but now you've been made alive by Jesus. Isn't that crazy? I mean, we were dead and now we're alive through Jesus. In chapter 5 of Ephesians, he says, you once were children of darkness, but now you are children of light. It's all about change. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is about change. That's really what it means to be a Christian. To be a Christian honestly means uh, not that you identify with some you know, church group or, or whatever. To be a Christian means that you are different because Jesus Christ has changed you. That's the essence of it. So has Jesus changed your life? And yes, I mean for that to be personal. Not our lives in the group, not John's life, because he just declared that to everybody, but your life personally. Has Jesus Christ changed you? Are you following Jesus? At some point in your life, has Jesus said, come follow me, and you said yes? You know, in the, in the kind of formal way we describe that, it means that you come to that place where you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins personally, and that he was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life. A commitment that is demonstrated by a changed life. This isn't about going to church. It's not about being a good person. It's not about turning over a new leaf. 
This is about experiencing that life-changing relationship with Jesus. So God is in the business of changing lives. And, and that means that when we commit to follow Jesus, then Jesus invites us into a dynamic experience. Uh, did, did you guys notice what he said? He said to the Peter and, and uh, Andrew, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. They didn't go, Jesus, could you please explain what it means to be fishers of men? Could you please explain to us where you're going to take us, what it's going to involve, what's going to be wrapped up in this? No, he just said, follow me. I'm not going to tell you where I'm going to lead you. I mean, eventually you'll get to heaven, okay? But along the way, not going to tell you the details. Follow me. Oh, and by the way, it's going to involve, you know, pain and suffering and, and difficulties. And, and, but, you know, I'm not going to tell you exactly which ones. Follow me and you're going to see things beyond your imagination. More than you ever thought you would see in ways you never experienced. You see, following Jesus is an adventure. Religion is boring. Jesus is not boring. Following Jesus is an adventure. That, I mean, this is what's crazy. And, and this irritates my soul, okay? I'm just going to say this. God calls us to live in freedom and faith. All right, that, that's the, the invitation to follow me. He calls us to discover beauty and goodness, to find purpose, to worship and celebrate and encourage and serve. He calls us to make a difference in this world. And yet somehow the church has managed to make this dynamic journey of faith tedious and boring. How in God's name did we do this? I mean, Jesus talked about freedom. And the church focuses on rules. Jesus created beauty and variety. That's why we can ask things like, hey, what's your favorite flower? Or, hey, what's your you know, favorite flavor ice cream? Because there's not just one. And yet the church tries to get people to conform. And when they do, it's usually to dull, uninspiring models. Jesus celebrated. Churches have perfected long, boring meetings. I mean, you think about it. It doesn't make any sense. Somehow the church has misplaced the wonder and the excitement and the joy of following Jesus. And we wonder why we're not appealing to people who don't know Jesus. Can I just encourage you to read the Gospels? And if you don't know what the Gospels are, the Gospels are the book of Matthew that we're looking at and the three that come after it. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay, those are the four books we call the Gospels. They explain the story of Jesus. They're four witness accounts of Jesus. They're a little bit different, but they all have the same basic story in them. And, and if you read the Gospels, Jesus was never, ever boring. Okay, not once. I mean, Jesus was a pot-stirring, tradition-challenging, miracle-working, demon-busting, controversial wanderer. I mean, you never knew what he was going to do or say next. He kept people guessing and off their toes and made them uncomfortable. And out of that, how do we get to boring? I mean, seriously, I mean, are we just boring because we're so predictable, so safe? You see, I think this is a problem of misrepresenting the nature of Jesus' calling on our lives. And, and it's endemic in churches everywhere. I don't want it to be in ours. I don't want it to be in our lives. And it was best shown by how I grew up with missions. I just got to tell you, some of you uh, experienced this too, but you guys know that Calvary is all about missions. I mean, we give 22% of our budgeted giving away to, to missions from Lake Havasu to the ends of the earth. Uh, we we want to lean into generosity. We go on mission trips. We, we take people on mission trips. I would love to take every single one of you on a mission trip, okay? Not just like all at once, all right? But I'd love to take you all on a mission trip. And some of you are like, yes, and some of you are like, oh, no, and the, the, the oh, no's are the ones who probably need to go the most. And, uh, <laughs> but here's the thing. Uh, I grew up in boring church, okay? Some of you did too. And, and, uh, and the worst part of boring church was when we had missionaries come. A anybody with me there? Anybody else? Okay. Because missionaries would show up, and, and they'd have their slides, and, if, and, and look, evangelists at least would, you know, slobber and spit and get all red in the face uh, when they were yelling at you. But missionaries were always calm and just kind of monotonous. And they would click the slide thing and they'd look at, look at the slide and they would talk about people that you never met. 
And, you, and, and I grew up thinking missions is the most boring thing that could happen. And then somebody had the audacity to take me on a mission trip. And I went on another one and another one. And you know what I found out? They're more like Indiana Jones and the next crusade. <laughs> I mean, it's like the Calvary Youth Group and the mission trip of doom. I mean, they're just, there's nothing boring about them. I mean, on mission trips, I've eaten fried worms and things far more disgusting, trust me. I've experienced torrential rains, like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it rains like this. I've been in crazy traffic that makes the most thrilling roller coaster look, eh. I mean, I'm serious. I've been places where that, that phrase, if you don't like the way I drive, stay off the sidewalk, is reality. Okay? I mean, it's just nuts. I, I, you know, I've, I've slept in a tent, okay? The canvas tent in a place called Land of the Lion. Yeah, they gave us a porta potty and a machete. The machete was for the snakes. Yeah, some of you are like, I'm not going on that trip. Yeah, you had to be young and a, and a guy to go on that one. Uh, and at the same time, I've seen hundreds, if not more, come to Christ. There's nothing boring about that. How do we lose the sense of adventure? What gets in the way of the dynamic life that Jesus calls us to? You see, the obstacles to a dynamic life are comfort and convenience and complacency. Comfort and convenience and complacency. And Satan is selling them. And a lot of churches and a lot of Christians are buying. We're so seduced by the security of sameness. Think about it. Comfort. Well, I like it the way it is. It's comfortable. I like the programs. And I like the music. And I like the Bible studies. And I like the styles. Don't change anything. I'm comfortable. Hey, welcome to Calvary. I hope you like it. We're going to change it. Okay? I, change is one of our core values. I already told you that, right? It's impossible to follow Jesus and stay where you are, stay the same. You're, you're going to go. It's going to change. It's going to happen. We're, we're going to mess it all up in about, you know, three weeks when we start new services at Parker and, and McCulloch. And some of you are going to go, I miss my friends. Where are they? Oh, they're over at McCulloch now. Why can't they just come to church with me like it was? It was so comfortable. It was so good. You know, you're going to go over to McCulloch and go, oh, but it's video sometimes. And why, I, why can't it always be live here like it was there? And, and it's going to be different. And, and with, sometimes we go, I don't like difference. Convenience. It's easy. I got it figured out. It works for my schedule. It works for my life. It doesn't cause any disruption. Complacency. It's just too hard to change. I'm in a rut, but I kind of like the rut. You know, it's good enough, so let's just kind of coast and take it easy. They're temptations. They might be descriptions of your life, but they're temptations. Satan whispers them into my life. I know he whispered into my, my ear uh, about 18 months ago, hey, just coast and take it easy. You've earned it. Take it easy. Problem with that is... Um, Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you need to deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and come follow me. He didn't say, be comfortable. No, he said, take up your cross. Deny yourself. He didn't say, hey, it's convenient. He wants you to go out of your way to follow him. He didn't, I'm not going to tell you where we're going. We're just going. You're going to follow me. Besides, Jesus was a disruptor. Anything convenient, he just ruined Complacency. He, he was, you know, no, it's just, let's go. There's a mission. You see, Jesus doesn't call us to comfort or convenience or complacency. He doesn't call us to security or safety or success. Jesus calls us to follow him wherever he leads and whatever the cost. And a lot of us call ourselves followers of Jesus. Is that true? So Jesus is calling you to a dynamic experience of life change. What is it that God wants you to change? What is it that God wants you to change? I, I really want that question to kind of haunt you through the night, maybe through the week, maybe through the rest of this year. And then you've got to figure out what is preventing you from being the man or woman that God called you to be. 
What is it that's getting in your way? The comfort of the addiction that you've known for so long? The complacency of your marriage? Hey, let's be honest. Some of our relationships are dying on the vine, and we're like, yeah, I know I should work at it, but it's just easy just to coast and let it head for that you know, cliff slowly. There's nothing easy uh, when Paul said, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and sacrificed his life for her. Nothing easy about loving your wife the way that, that Christ loved the church. There's nothing easy about parenting your children and, and being involved in their life. You're like, yeah, I don't really want to talk about that. That's uncomfortable. I really don't want to do that. I don't want to do discipline because they won't like me. No, we're talking about what's worth it, what Jesus is calling us to. What is preventing you from being the man or woman that God is calling you to be? And how does God want you to change? Because Jesus is calling us to a dynamic experience of life change. And then God calls us to be change agents. God is in the business of changing the world. Have you noticed that? He, he, he sent Jesus into this world to be the Savior. That, that's what Christmas is all about. I know you guys know this, or at least I'm assuming you guys know this. So let me remind you. The whole reason for Christmas is because God invaded the world as Savior. Right? Took on human form, clothed himself as a baby, wrapped swaddled clothes, manger. You guys remember the story, right? Okay, good. He invaded the world because he wanted to save us. He is on a, you know, world-saving mission. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then you are a son and daughter of God. That's cool, isn't it? We love that title. I'm a son of God. I'm a daughter of God. We're children of God. This is awesome. But with that comes family responsibilities. And so our Heavenly Father is saying, hey, I'm on this world-changing mission, the world-saving mission. I want you, my children, to join me on this mission. And this is such an honor. This is so cool. This is, this is, this is Jesus inviting us, inviting you to help him change the world. There's no better assignment. Can I just mention that to you? I, I mean, I, I, it is awesome being married and having kids and having grandkids, and I love that. But, but you know, this whole I get to be in, in Jesus' service thing is, is awesome. Now, they're my first ministry responsibility, so I'm going to take care of them. I love them. But it starts with that receiving that responsibility from Jesus and saying, hey, I'm going to join Jesus in helping him change the world. And I hope you're ready to join Jesus in helping him change the world, because that's the invitation that is to you, right? Follow me, and there's a purpose to following me. I will make you fishers of men. Fishers of men. This is the change part. I want to use you to change the world. So uh, here's how it happens. If we say yes, and I'm praying that every one of you says yes, we serve God works. Okay, we serve God works. You and I are incapable of changing anybody. Some of you have been fruitlessly trying with your marriage for like 40 years. Okay? And, and you know, the, the conversation probably goes something like this, aren't you ever going to get this? And the, the spouse goes, no, I'm not. See, that's just it. We can't change anybody. And honestly, we can't really change ourselves either. We need God's power to do that. We're helpless and, and we need Christ, and that's why we come to him, and we ask him to change us, and, and that's why we want to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ, because you and I can't do it, but Jesus can. So we serve, and God works. And, and so as, as we connect with the community, as, as we serve people, as we demonstrate the character of Jesus, God shows up in powerful ways. He just shows up. He works through us. He works miracles through us. And it's incredible to see that happen if we will do our part, which is we serve and God works. God's working anyway. You might as well go ahead and join him. Because otherwise, that joy we were singing about, it's not going to happen. 
It's really not going to happen. And there's some of you that are joy challenged and your life is like, there's just not enough joy in my life. And, and the world's telling you, hey, what you need to do is, you know, buy more of this and, and get more of that and take a vacation here. And, and, and if you drive this kind of car or get this kind of motorcycle, that's going to make joy happen. And it's not. See, real joy happens when we do it God's way and we start serving. Because when we serve, God works, and he works in us, and he works through us, and he changes us as he uses us to change the world. Now, let's just say you go, all right, I'm going to serve, I'm going to let God work. Don't be overwhelmed by the enormity of the task. Because God has invited us into, you know, being agents of changing the world. But God doesn't expect you to change the world alone. God changes the world one person at a time. God changes the world one person person at a time. See, God's not asking you to personally impact Africa or China. He, he's not asking you to go out and suddenly be the person who is, makes a worldwide impact, but he is asking you to impact Havasu and Parker, because that's where you live. That's where we serve. That's where we're working. And, and, and God's not actually expecting you to influence the entire city. Okay? Now, us as a church, He's expecting to influence the entire city, but he's expecting you to influence your family, your friends, your circle of influence, whether that circle of influence is three people or 30 people. That's what he wants you to do, to be faithful where he's put you to make a difference in the people that you know. And so he wants to work through you to change their lives. So who is it that God wants to change through your life? I want you to think about this for a moment. Who is it that God wants you to, to be a life-changing agent in? Who are the friends that really, really, really need Jesus? Who are your family members that are far from God? You're like, yeah, but they don't even listen to me. They won't talk to me about Jesus. No, but you can be praying for them. You can be, you know, waiting for that that reconciliation to happen. You can be waiting for that life change to happen. You can be the one who's their, their cheerleader. Who do you know that you can influence for Christ? I, I'm, I'm so thankful, because I didn't orchestrate this at all, but if I had orchestrated it, if I was smart enough to, I, I would have had John get baptized tonight. John approached us and said, I'm going to get baptized tonight. Okay? It had, had nothing to do with us. It was just him and the Holy Spirit doing this. Because his story, which I got to hear this week, it was, was one where a friend, a neighbor really, just saw his life and kept inviting him to come to church. Knew that he needed God. Talked to him about a relationship with Jesus and, and he couldn't answer that. So she knew he needed that relationship with Jesus. Just kept inviting. Just kept inviting. And I use the word harassing because it, it took a year. She didn't give up. So many times people want to go, I, I ask him once. You want me to ask him again? <laughs> yeah, we do. And again. If you care about him, that's being a good neighbor. That's being a hero. That's, that, that's just demonstrating that, that God wants to use you to change one person at a time. So who do you know that you can influence for Christ? And now here's the challenge. Here's the challenge. This is for everyone who's a follower of Jesus Christ. Who are your three? Who are your three people that you're going to invite to come Christmas Eve? Who are the three people that you're going to invite to come to the new campus launch in Parker or at McCulloch? Who are the three people that you're going to invite to come and start the new year off by, by checking out God and maybe, you know, starting the, a new chapter in their life? Who are your three? I say three because... Probably all of us know three people who are far from God. Three people who aren't interested in the things of God, aren't showing up in church, asking questions. They're just living life and they're struggling. And you know they're struggling because you're close enough to their life to see it. Who are your three? What if all of us invited three people to come Christmas Eve or the campus launch or just come to church with you sometime in January. What if we did that? What would God do through our faithfulness and our obedience? I'm pretty sure there'd be a whole lot more stories like John's. Celebrating life change in Jesus Christ. 
You see, God wants to change their lives through you. And God wants to change your life. Change. It's one of our core values. But it's impossible to follow Jesus and stay the same. Will you pray with me?